In this very short second and last podcast of the chapter on kinetics or reaction rates, we're going to look at what are reaction mechanisms. So far, we've learned about how you can determine the average rate of a reaction. We've also learned about the factors that influence the rate of a reaction. So now let's take a look at what is a reaction mechanism. And officially defined, it's a statement of the steps in an overall reaction, and it includes your initial reactants, intermediate products, and the final or end products. So all along this past year, as we've written an equation, you might have assumed that they just happen in one step, but frequently they are quite complex. It's probably not AB turning immediately into product 2E. It might be something that you see here where there are a series of steps where we produce an intermediate product C, which turns into an intermediate product D, and finally you get the final product 2E. Now the rate at which a reaction occurs is a function of each individual reaction in that series of reaction mechanism having its own reaction rate. So the rate of the overall net reaction is determined by the rate of the slowest intermediate step. I like to use the analogy of your grandpa on the freeway. Of course, grandpas tend to drive cars that are big boats. And they feel safe inside them. Unlike your adolescent incredible reflexes, grandpa's not got quite as speedy of reflexes as you. So he's going to be in the fast lane, and instead of doing 65, he might be doing 45-50. And <clears throat> he's got a big boat of a car to protect him because he's not too good on those reflexes. So let's pretend you're behind grandpa. You've stolen daddy's Porsche. I don't care that your Porsche can go from 0 to 150 in 6 seconds. I don't care. As long as grandpa is blocking you in that fast lane, your grandpa is what we call in chemistry the rate determining step. Doesn't matter that you can have a car that goes as fast as a Porsche. Grandpa's Lincoln or Continental or Buick is keeping you from proceeding at a faster rate. Well, in chemistry, we call that the rate determining step. Now what you would like to, I'd like for you to see in this first and last slide, I should say, is this is the overall reaction. But it doesn't just happen that nitrogen monoxide and hydrogen make nitrogen and water. First thing is, each of them has their own individual reaction mechanism. So first, nitrogen monoxide turns into dinitrogen dioxide then dinitrogen dioxide turns into, uh, reacts with hydrogen to turn into dinitrogen monoxide and water. And so on until you get to the third step that you can see here. So it's not just a one-step process, it's a three-step process. Each of the three reactions that you see here correspond to each of these energy diagrams that you see in this picture on the bottom right. Now remember, if you want to find the activation energy, you take your starting point and you go to the, quote, top of that energy hill. It just shows that for you to have a successful reaction, the height of that hill indicates how much energy that your reactants have to smack into each other with. So if you can compare the three steps that are listed here with their corresponding energy diagrams that you see here, Start from the trough or from the starting point and go to the top of each energy hill. Decide in your own mind which of those three is the greatest activation energy. Remember, for a reaction to occur, you have to have sufficient activation energy as well as the right orientation. The higher the hill, the greater the energy required for the reactants to bump into each other. And you can conclude that would be the step that has the slowest rate, the equivalent of grandpa in the fast lane. So as I look at these three hills, I'm seeing that <clears throat> the first reaction has a pretty slow, excuse me, a pretty low act, uh, activation energy. Not very much energy required to form the temporary molecule called the activated complex. If I compare the next two steps, which I hope you're doing at this point in time, I hope you can see that the highest hill, the greatest activation energy, is found in the second step. 
to go from N2O2 and hydrogen gas into N2O plus water, that's a really slow step. And then relatively speaking, we don't necessarily know with the first and the third step who is necessarily faster than each other, but it's irrelevant. It's the slow step in the middle that determines the overall rate of the reaction. Doesn't matter that your first step is fast. Doesn't matter that your third step is fast. What matters is the rate of the general equation, this one here, depends upon the rate of the second step in this example. Your slow step could be any step in the reaction mechanism. It might be the first one, the middle one, the last one. But whichever one is the slowest is the one that you want to manipulate uh, to manipulate in an attempt to make your reaction happen faster. Now I'd like to do a little math thing if you don't mind. I'm not sure if it'll show up on this slide. But see how we have N2O2 produced in one step. But in the next step it becomes a reactant and gets consumed. Or this N2O, dinitrogen monoxide, in the second step as a product becomes a reactant in the third step. We call substances that are produced in one step and consumed in the next intermediates. And kind of like you do that Hess's Law thing, you can cancel them out since they're on opposite sides of the arrow. Now obviously the rate determining step in this particular um, sequence is the middle one. And what we're going to do on a subsequent worksheet is to talk about how can you determine what are the intermediates and what is it that you can do to try to increase the reaction rate. For example, if you increase concentration as proven in our um, iodine clock reaction, you can increase the reaction rate. So the point would be that if I want to make this equation here go faster, I need to increase the concentration of the reactants on the left to make the slowest step go faster, the equivalent of like riding grandpa's tail and getting him to put the pedal to the metal. If you do anything to two steps that are already fast, like the first step or the third step, it will have no impact on the overall rate. So what we provided for your learning pleasure is a worksheet in your packet that looks something like this. You can try and go ahead to start this worksheet. We'll be working, it, working on it in class when we get together next. But we have this and a second worksheet about reaction mechanisms. And then the chapter on kinetics is done. Very short. You can expect some sort of quest or lab quiz to follow this particular unit. If you can uh, increase concentration on reactions, uh, remember you only want to work on whichever step is the slowest. And secondly, if you have either an endo or an exothermic reaction, you might want to look at the impact of increasing or decreasing the temperature. If you determine that your rate determining step, the slowest one in the sequence, is endothermic, Giving it more heat will speed that up and speed up the overall reaction. Or if it's exothermic, chilling it down, removing heat will drive that reaction to go faster. You can give it your best shot. I'll have some class time to work on it. This is the end of the last podcast for the chapter 17 on kinetics.